Today's podcast guest is Derek Hanley, very well-known New Zealand entrepreneur who has conquered the global stage. We get to share in the journey and the insights that Derek has learned from his early days of wanting to prove something to the world through to now reflecting and asking every single day, how can I make a good and valuable contribution to the world? He gives us his top three tips. He talks about trusting instinct, about knowing the whole person in your team, not just their work persona, and also the importance of time blocking for reflection and growth of both a personal and business nature. This was an amazing opportunity to get inside the mind of a successful entrepreneur, but also into the mind of a great human. Please welcome Derek Handley. Hey Derek, welcome along to the podcast. We are super pumped to have you joining us today. Thank you uh, so much for giving us your time. Maybe let's dive straight into some value for our for our listeners. You have stood up a huge number of teams, both directly in your own businesses and via your companies that you've invested in. What would be a, an insight of uh, some of the key things you see in standing up high-performing teams? Okay, um, thanks for having me. That's an interesting question. I think... Well, specifically regarding, regarding teams, I think one of the things I've learned uh, is the power of your instinct and your judgment, um, you know, especially as a younger kind of founder or builder, second guessing and questioning uh, what you feel instinctively um, versus what you think rationally has been a challenge that's always been you know, com- complex for me. And when I look back, I think the instinctive uh, feelings about people, about decisions have, have mostly been the right ones, even though often I've overridden them. So that will probably be one that I think is super powerful if I could tell you know, myself 10 years ago to be much more responsive to uh, what I felt versus what I thought. Mm-hmm. So that's probably one. I think um, in building teams early, uh, I think the world's changed a lot in the last, you know, 10 years even, but I used to have a philosophy of like everyone, you know, needs to go hard and basically unite their lifestyle and their life to whatever the project or endeavor was at hand. And that really meant, you know, sacrificing personal aspects or um, time that they may have been spending better in terms of family and health and things like that. And I really think now people realize that you have to, take the whole person, uh, really understand how does this team holistically, sustainably flourish in all aspects of their life. Um, And I think that's part of a transition that we're starting to understand that people and their lives are the most important thing first and that their work is just a piece of their life. And so really integrating and having a holistic view and a holistic conversation with people that work with you about their whole lives is something that's super important in team building and and recruiting and actually just working with people. And I definitely think that was not the way the world thought of it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, which was work as work and, you know, personal as personal. So those are two key things that I think are really interesting. The third thing I think is that I really um, try to help encourage team or people who work with me to create blocks of time in their world that are sacred. So times where they are either totally disconnected and are thinking in totally different thinking styles so reflecting on their overall, their overall journey, um, reflecting on their values or principles, reflecting on the long run, like three, five, 10 years, what are they thinking about, who are they trying to be and become, and creating space for that on a regular basis is really difficult because the, the, the immediacy is really much more attention grabbing. Um, and on a week by week basis, protecting space to think about the next month or the next quarter or the next year on a quarterly basis, maybe protecting space to think about the next year or two years. And, you know, at least on a yearly basis, thinking about the longer term. So building these habits and practices in teams is really difficult because with the advent of digital fully connected lifestyle, we have been trained to be super responsive as humans, responding to email, responding to text, responding to noise, responding to everything and to create and carve out and protect sacred, quiet, unplugged, disconnected space is something that is, is, is harder and harder to do, but that I think is more and more important as time goes on. 
Absolutely. And Derek, it's uh, phenomenal. It feels like you're preaching from our playbook, uh, particularly on those second two topics of bringing the whole person to work. Uh, one of our key philosophies is we say health, family, work in that order. So you need to prioritize, you know, looking after yourself, both physical and mental, make sure your family and friends connections are in good space. And then, of course, work uh, is, a, is an important but not the first priority in, in the whole person. So I'm keen to dig into that one a bit more. And then we're also huge fans of uh, taking that uh, time, we call it development days, You're regularly in your zone where you have no meetings, no calls, uh, email, emails turned off and actually do some thinking about improving, developing or transforming what it is that you're, you're doing. So uh, totally mm-hmm. aligned on those approaches. Um, let, let's dig into the bringing the whole person to work and uh, for you as an individual, how do you go about doing that? You're, uh, you know, I guess we call you a global citizen. Would that be fair? You know, you operate in uh, numerous time zones uh, all the world with the various businesses, uh, different locations that you operate from. Uh, you you have family. How do you go about trying to balance that? Always, always connected and making sure you look after yourself and your family um, as well as meet your your business you know, objectives or or goals. Yeah. I think in the past, um, it's a lot of it's come through that thinking time, you know, the, the point two and three related. So when you spend the time and protect the time to think about what's really important, you then can decide uh, the things that you want to do to support those things, the activities you want to undertake, the people you want to connect with, the time you want to spend. So when I find that I go uh, off the rails in terms of this issue that we're talking about, it's when I've squashed out the time from my calendar that I know is really, really important to the the, the thinking and the reflecting. So I think they kind of come hand in hand. At the moment, the last um, four or five months, I've found it much more difficult, uh, especially with the kind of restrictions in the home, the, the patterns that have been broken, the rituals that have been disrupted. And I, I found that I'm in the second wave this year of rebuilding, rebuilding muscles, rebuilding rituals, rebuilding practices, because it's, it, I find it very difficult in the first and second um, lockdowns in New Zealand to have to redesign rituals and practices and then change them again when the world opened up and then change them again when we went back down. And so, to be honest, I've, I've had a difficult year of protecting that. And also with the Zoom world, and as you said, we you know we have, at least for the things that I do, I speak to people in all different time zones. So in reality, I could be on Zoom 24-7 And um, what I found really challenging about that is that in the real world, when you meet with people, you have to build in time to go from A to B. You have to build in travel time. You have to build in what if I'm late or what if there's traffic. And these little decompression moments actually are super valuable. And in this fully virtual world where we were, you know, seven, whatever, how many weeks where you're doing everything from home, you could end up finding that your entire day has just been zoomed out. And I think those things really started to, to, to cause me issues that I'm still trying to pull, pull myself out of and forcing yourself to move and get out of the house and, you know, do things that get you physically in different contexts. So context physically has also been really powerful and important to me. Changing the physical context of where you are to change your thought process. So taking a notebook and going somewhere where you'd sit and reflect on your overall you know, the pie chart of who you are, like how are all the different things in balance or in flow? Uh, I think that's really useful, even if it's a 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, without devices, um, with just the context of thoughts and maybe a pen. So these are some of the things that are super important to me. I also think, uh, you know, building in time to be with family is really, is really critical to this as well. And, and in the lockdowns, that's been again, disrupted because I have a seven-year-old and, you know, they basically had two hours of school in a week and you're kind of merging everything to try and keep them engaged and positive and productive, but also try to do everything, you know, that you've got on your plate. So I think to be fair, I found this year 
lots of things about it have been very interesting and positive, but, but mostly on the work and performance side, I've found it quite difficult. Absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a common, common theme. And you talked about the challenge of the practices and rituals. Definitely felt that myself where in that first lockdown, it took a bit of a while to get in zone, but felt at by, you know, so a couple of weeks in that had some of those practices and rituals and was getting more effective and then got back into work, rebuilt it. And then the second lockdown came and many people that I've spoken to have said they found the second lockdown much harder than the first because they were, again, having to reestablish all those things. So I can definitely uh, connect you on those ones. Do you have a do you have a personal champion that uh, maybe sits uh, alongside you in a personal perspective and goes, "Hey, Derek, you're just getting a bit of a, out of balance here," or is there someone in your zone that holds you to account there? Um, well, there are a few people, but mostly it is I mean myself. Like, so I I have got really good at uh, observe. I think anyway, you know. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, observing myself and understanding how I'm feeling, how things are playing out. And that's not so much the challenge. So, you know, looking down on what's going on in myself and how I'm behaving um, and responding, I am getting much better at that. The, the, the shift then to change things when things aren't going really well, I found at least this year has been much harder for me. Um, so in terms of like acknowledging when things aren't going so well, so there are lots of signals that I have learned about myself that can tell me that. So it could be, I mean, I'm a very good sleeper, excellent. Uh, you know, I sleep very well. If, if my sleep starts to get disturbed, then I realize that that's a big signal because generally, you know, even when there's a huge amount of stress on, if I've got enough decompression space, if I've got enough thinking space, if I've got the patterns right, I sleep very well. So that, that's an example of, you know, signals coming up. Um, not having uh, been physical enough, like going out, doing things, walking around, when I realize that I'm very, uh, like, sedentary because you're kind of computer and those kind of things, I realize those are also um, signals to, to change or um, revisit patterns. My attention span and kind of, what do you call it, like, you're uh, short, you know, if your fuse gets shorter, I can kind yes. of notice... Um, when my fuse is shorter and the first person to notice will be my son and the second person to notice, you know, would be my wife. So those people would be the ones that would start to mirror back, you know, what's going on, which would then help me look inside as to the things I need to, to shift. So there's a number of layers, both internal kind of triggers and then the people that are around me. Um, and then I have a coach. I've had coaches for a very long time, you know, since, I mean, a really long time, maybe 15 years. And as long as I'm in touch with them regularly, then that also is a really good check-in to help recognize when things need to be uh, revisited or shifts need to take place. Got it. Uh, I'd, I'd like to dig back maybe a little bit into your, your past because I think your, your journey has been a fascinating one, Derek, where you've gone um, from the, you know, the very early epic success of Hyperfactory and then through to some of the organizations and endeavors you're involved with now where I... Uh, since you've taken a greater tilt towards how can I do really good in the world? Yes, I'm still uh, an entrepreneur. Yes, I still like to create successful businesses. I like them to have a profit line, but underpinning each each of those uh, or many of the endeavors you're involved in now is like, how do I do good with the world? How do we create sustainability? Can you uh, initially take me to the, what was your driving force around uh, Hyperfactory? What was your kind of focus, focus then and how that's now evolved for you? when you when you think about the things you're involved with now yeah it's very it's very visceral for me kind of the beginning um of my i guess adventures in really it's around you know 2000 literally kind of graduating from university and i this was at, also at the 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 dot-com you know bomb mm -hmm. or blow up sure. or bust so the whole hypes and dreams of, you know, young people creating incredible things as I was at university, 97, 8, 9, you could see all these amazing things happen. It imploded as we, as we graduated. And um, my, my thinking was, okay, this is probably a good time to build something and to try and create a new sort of dream because we're at the bottom of the curve. And if you can do something in this, at this point, then you could almost do anything. That was kind of the thinking that I had. So I got, I got into a graduate program with Fletcher Challenge at the end of my university, but I honestly didn't last, I, I think it was not even five months as I was cooking up ideas to build a venture. And what motivated me at the time is very different to what motivated me now, but what motivated me then was 
to show that a young person could build a global, digitally oriented, future oriented company from New Zealand. It was very much this idea of um, an ego oriented project. Like, I want to prove that I can build this, I can be this person, and I can um, show New Zealand, show young people that this is possible, you know, that we should be doing this. And that was kind of the main motivator. Can you be an early young founder that takes something from the bottom of the earth and builds a global company while you're in your 20s? So what it was became a secondary question. And right. I went through a deep process of mapping different trends of where I thought the world was going. And since this time, this has always been a part of the way I think, what are the macro level shifts in big things that are going to change the way humanity works, the way we, we live, and what are the technologies or changes in innovation that may enable them or withhold them or hold them back? And where are the opportunities to create something, whether it's a business or a nonprofit or whatever it might be. And so back in 2000, what through all this mapping and this exercise that I did, you know, my nights while I was at Fletcher's, I had a number of different views of the future, but the main one that was the most compelling was that we were going to move from a society that was on the desktop to a society where everyone would have devices in their pockets that would essentially remote control their lives. And so that's what was the foundation of saying, okay, we'll build a company on the top of that thesis, on the top of that theory that will help that transition. And that is essentially what Hyperfactory was. And we built a lot of technologies, products, platforms that enabled big companies to make the leap from the web to mobile. And, you know, that was the first, I guess, 10 years of my uh, adventure based on that one macro level, uh, I guess, perspective and yes. prediction and you know it took a while because at that time the only thing you could really do was use text messaging and there was more belief in asia that you know 3g was coming and things were going to be different and it didn't really land globally until the iphone launched which was in 2006 so it took yes. you know five or six years as a young founder to keep alive stay alive until the tide actually arrived um, but that was the initial uh, impetus behind, you know, that adventure. Jake, let me ask, during that five years where you were, I guess, waiting for the macro level thinking to come to reality, um, did you consider giving up or walking away within in that zone? I don't, I don't know if we ever considered giving up because we were so convinced that this was inevitable. Um, we definitely had to change strategies numbers of a number of times. And we tried lots of different places. Like we went to, you know, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, tried to build revenue there, um, Australia. It was a lot of hard work, making a lot of mistakes, waiting for the wave to get there. Yes. And of course, it, it just requires lots and lots of capital. And then every time you do, you know, you, you raise more resources, you dilute your own interests and all that stuff. And so the, the, the economic incentive gets smaller as it takes longer to achieve something like this. But the spiritual incentive is still there, which is just to, to be there when the thing arrives is part one. Be a player when the thing happens, when the transition happens. Don't be someone that didn't make it. And secondly, build it out. Like build the story that you had in your mind that, yes, a young person can do this. There's no reason why someone cannot do this from New Zealand. And at the time, you know, right, it's like nobody was doing this. Absolutely nobody. Like there was no sure. you know, angel investing, ice house venture. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. There were no kids leaving New Zealand to go and build digitally global companies. And yeah. that was part of the buccaneering spirit that, you know, my, myself and my brother had. It's like, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't. And I don't think of my competitor in Ponsonby Road as my competitor. I think of my competitor as the person in London or New York. And that was how we started, you know, um, our, I guess, ethos. And Derek, your, your parallel is, you know, Sir Edmund Hillary being a, a Kiwi, um, you know, beehive expert going, I'd like to go and call, uh, climb the tallest mountain in the world. Um, actually no different because you were uncharted territory. You were a, a Kiwi lad going, how do we go and conquer the world? Just happened that your mountain was a, a digital one, not a, not a physical one. But I see, uh, I see real parallels there. <laughs> well, that's, 
obviously it's quite a different challenge, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is the sense of if you're going to do something, you might as well try to be the best in the world and you might as well try to do something that is globally relevant and contributes globally. Um, and I think that's my, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing because it's a good thing because obviously it means that your standards and your aspirations and everything are really at the, you know, you really hold them yes. high. Mm -hmm. It's not as good a thing if, you know, you live in New Zealand like I do now, cause I didn't, uh, you know, for the last uh, 15 years I was in New York, but um, there's a lot of things I could do here. There's a lot more I could contribute. There's a lot of things I could get in behind and all that kind of thing. And you've got to balance your time. Well, what, what's local and what's global yes. and you know, the hybrid of that, especially now that I, now that I live here. Absolutely. And when you started uh, Hyperfactory with, with your brother, was there some really natural roles that you guys took on? Um, was someone the sales guy and someone was the tech guy? Was it someone was the team builder and, and someone was the strategist? Was that how it worked? Yeah, I think it, it was, yeah? it was, it was, um, it was quite natural and there was some crossover for sure, but yeah, it was a more natural fit than not. Okay. And what was, what, what do you think the key role that you played in that? What was, what was what you brought to the table most significant? I think at the beginning it was the, it was the, the navigator, you know, the, the, where is it going? Where are we going? How do you build the ship to get there? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, it, what might it need and what tax and strategy shifts might it take to keep it going to get over the line kind of thing. Um, and then towards the end, as I got more confident and got, you know, developed new skills and believed more in myself than I could also add, add value as a, you know, developer sales, sales and kind of like a being a front person that helped build mm -hmm. what we were doing at the front line as well. Right. Okay. As you've evolved, uh, you've, you've now got, uh, is it a Vera? Is, it, is that error? Uh, error, 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 sorry, yeah. error. Um, I, I had my V in the wrong place being a VC company. Um, yeah. So error, and you talk about that organization being an activist VC, what does that mean to you when you talk, when you think about ERA? So ERA is actually a foundation that my wife and I set up, you know, using part of the proceeds from when we uh, exited a hyperfactory. But, um, you know, this is going quite a long way back. And what it, what it was intended to stand for was the word comes from the Latin root ERA. So, uh, sorry, it is the Latin root for the word ERA in all the different Latin languages. So basically of our time, of our generation, yes. of, our, of our epoch. And what I wanted to do was build a incubator. It's almost like a charitable trust that was an incubator for ideas that were of our time, that were of our generation, that were important and reflective of transitions that were happening um, today, like in the next 10 or 20 years. So one of the things that, that ended up happening to me during the last phases of you know, the hyperfactory such a long time ago was during the recession. So last time around that the world was really in deep pain um, was the closest point that we got to losing that company. It was pretty much weeks away from losing that company. And at that point I had, I guess you could call it an epiphany of some sort. I had a very, like a clearing appeared in my life and a set of lights appeared that identified to me that assuming this thing failed, which was the thing I'd built nine years, uh, eight years of my life on, would you go out and do the same thing again? Or would you rethink how you contribute your time and your resources and your skills? And that started a conversation in my mind about, well, what are the real problems that are of my time and of my generation that if I believe in myself enough, should I actually be trying to contribute to addressing as opposed to, you know, say maybe a technology idea or innovation idea. And that's when I started to, to get really immersed in um, the issues of, of transitioning to a more sustainable uh, future for the world and for the economy and, and for all the things that we do. And that became the beginning of, I guess, the next chapter, um, you know, the last 10 years of my life, which has been a steady one foot in front of the other transition to understanding how do I contribute my skills and time in my life towards playing a role in making that transition happen because we are the ones who need to make it happen and our children are the ones that will need to ensure that when they look back at us that we did our part so that's what the foundation is kind of there as an incubator to spin up different ideas that can catalyze things like that and one of the first things that we started to work on was 
Well, there are lots of entrepreneurs that are building amazing companies that are trying to address these issues, whether it's the future of food, climate, energy, the environment, equality of access, health. And at the time, there were very few early stage investors that were specializing in these issues from a venture capital perspective. And that's really what AeroVC has been practicing its art in the last few years. The term activist, I think, came out when we first started talking about it a few years ago. It really was just an idea that, you know, we stand for an idea more than Mm -hmm. the idea of being a venture fund. We stand for an idea that there is a sustainable future that we need to co-create. There are unsustainable practices and behaviors that need to evolve, we need to evolve from. And the idea is that the fund or the vehicle or our community will stand up for those ideas and back the champions, the visionaries, the people who are trying to help us get there. So that's, you know, the intention of it. It's um, around believing that we will come through these seemingly impossible issues. And not only will we do that, we'll do it in an innovative, beautiful, exciting way. And not only will we do that, but probably the winners in that field will create enormous financial opportunity and basically create new markets, new products and new sectors that will slowly but steadily disrupt and dismantle, you know, the largest companies in the world that exist today. Sure. And Derek, can you dig into one of the uh, venture ideas that you've supported, one that you feel very connected to because it, it has met with those values you have of creating change and sustainability and a better world going forward? What's one that, you know, stands out for you when I ask that question? Well, we have a number of themes, but, you know, I like we've got involved in a number that are um, training disadvantaged communities to be uh, digitally talented, you know, uh, coders and um, designers and basically creating livelihoods for people that have otherwise very difficult prospects. And at the same time, creating, you know, enormous uh, value in terms of like a business as a development center or a coding academy or an education platform. There's not lots of different ways to see that. So we've been involved in a number of companies like one called Andela, which is in Africa, mm. one called Bitwise, yes. which is in the U.S. Mm. Uh, we are a part of a number of companies at the future of food. And that at the moment, as your listeners probably know, is kind of a hybrid of uh, the future of plant-based or other based proteins which are replicating or mimicking meats in a way that doesn't require animals or cell based so growing things in a lab which again doesn't require um, the factory farming so we have got involved in companies that are the future of you know cell based cheese cell based seafood plant based dog food protein like all sorts of different alternatives there which i think we will have a myriad of things explode over the coming decade Um, We already know some of them that are super famous, like Impossible and Beyond Meat. But I think every category is being challenged in that field. Indeed. Indeed. Even the good old vegan trumpet that's made an appearance on uh, New Zealand supermarket (laughs) shelves. Um, Already, let me ask you, talk about this time blocking to get away, reflect, think, maybe thinking about clearly your personal life, uh, your, I like that idea of a pie chart of going, what are the things that are important to me and where's the balance in that that pie chart at the moment? Um, When you spend time currently thinking about what macro shifts are coming, what's top of mind for you? Well, apart from the ones we just spoke about, uh, which is more like the redesigning of, of the global economy and kind of the way we, we live, I think we have some really challenging issues with the way we consume content and media uh, that, you know, is really difficult to discern a balanced argument on different issues that are really important. And we are getting really, I mean, when I was obviously in the last few years in the US, it just became more and more and more and more polarized and I have yes. noticed even in the last two years in New Zealand, I have been a little bit shocked at how polarizing some arguments are in New Zealand. I always thought we were fair, balanced, willing to listen to the other person, yes. um, willing to have another view, willing to at least consider another option. And I've been a, a little bit anxious about seeing really polarizing perspectives in New Zealand that aren't willing to listen to the other side. So that's one of the things that I think isn't going to end well unless we somehow intervene. 
And I don't know what that looks like, but the way the current media landscape works is they're not going to intervene because anything that hypes up a media audience is what they're going to keep doing because the business model is so broken that relies on clicks and page views and stuff. And we all know that psychologically what drives clicks and page views is provocations, fear, the othering of people, um, you know, all the negative things that get people uh, on the fight or flight kind of bandwagon. So that's one thing that I think is really challenging. And so how do we become wiser in this sense, in this mix of all this chaos that's something that I'm working on. I started a conversation series called Wiser Conversations, which I've also turned into a podcast where I'm talking to different thinkers from psychological or spiritual backgrounds about how to reflect on this experience of being human at this time, in this time of the pandemic, in this time of chaotic media, in this time of you know, really uh, ravaging climate issues, race issues, all these kinds of, of issues. So my hope is that we can start putting building blocks that get people to reflect more on what it is to live wisely and not just respond to what's being fire hosed down at us through all the channels that we've started to become, um, you know, plugged in and attached to. I do think some of the uh, benefit of the uh, change in the media model is that there are now a lot more avenues for us to uh, make choice for it. So Previously, you know, it was kind of this network or that network and you, you chose your network and that was the information you got uh, subscribed and provided. Now we do have options. We can join the Wiser Thinkers podcast and go, hey, I may not see you on the mainstream TV, but I'm really interested in what you're talking about. So I now have access to that, which I think previously was harder. So <clears throat> I think mm. there are, I, I totally understand the, the challenges of how mainstream media is uh, driving all that negative emotion to try and prop up their revenue line but i think Mm. the openness of things that we can now connect to but that does come back to one of your earlier points is we all need our own personal awareness so we actually Mm. do need to stop and go what do i want to consume who do i want to listen to uh what would help with my thinking or broader Mm. awareness in the organization we have to kind of make that choice if we just sit uh blindly or dumbly on the couch and go tell me what to look at Uh, we're never going to get there but if we take a bit of time uh, maybe at our next uh, zone with our notebook sitting on the park bench, uh, thinking about, you know, where, where am I getting my ideas uh, and where could I broaden what I'm thinking about might be a good use of that, uh, that next block of time on the, on the park bench. Mm, yes. Let me throw a couple of other questions at you, Derek, which I'm really interested to uh, hear about. I know you spent a bit of time with Richard Branson in the the B team, um, and I'm sure you learned some things when you were with Richard, but tell me, what do you think you taught him? (laughs) That's a good question. Um, Wow, I think you'd probably have to ask him. Well, what was fascinating about that, and I kind of go into it in the book that I wrote shortly after, which is called Heart to Start. What the fascinating about that experience was I presented him an opportunity to basically have my, you know, a year of my life in 2012 to work on a project that he thought was important enough that he could convince me I should contribute to. And this was really all in a kind of, you know, in the course of an evening, but really in the course of an hour, this discussion happened. And I think what was perhaps interesting for him was turning the tables to say, well, there's a year of someone's life and um, they're an entrepreneur. They're not, you know, you know, Steve jobs or anyone, but they can be useful. Mm -hmm. You know, what have you got that's going on that's useful and interesting enough that maybe he can help with. And I think that dynamic was interesting to him that helped us collaborate to very, very quickly on that evening, decide that we would do something together and we barely, you know, quite barely knew each other. But Mm -hmm. I think um, that interesting interplay, um, he responded to really positively. And that became the seed of, you know, our, I guess, partnership, because that's how I thought of it. You know, I didn't think of it like I'm going to go work for for Virgin. And yeah, I don't know what, what, what I taught him in the end, but I think they were struggling to get this project off the ground for a few years. And I think the rapidity of like saying, okay, I can go in and, and, and get this moving. Cause that's what I think I know how to do from a white piece of paper to, you know, blank piece of paper to a reality um, and proving and, and delivering on that. I, I, I hope he, you know, he found a value. 
Absolutely. And I think what's uh, stood out across the things you've achieved is your ability to go from ideas to action to outcome. And uh, I'm certain that one of the most common things that entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, people leaders hear is uh, when something has been achieved and it's been successful, people go, oh, yeah, I had that idea. And like, yes, you did have the idea, but you didn't take it to action and then, and then outcome. What is it that do you think allows you to, um, yes, take the time to think, look at macro level shifts, consider how you might get there, but why do you think you stand out from the crowd? What is it about you that allows you to go from ideas to outcomes? Yeah, I actually do not know the answer to this because um, my wife, Maya, always says that I underestimate how some other people, how hard they find the conversion of like, um, you know, concept to literally bang, 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 bang. And it's kind of, you know, live or done. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, however I was made or born or, you know, grown, I naturally have ability to be in both camps. So I could sit with you for a day thinking about where the world could be in one year, five years, 10 years, 500 years. That to me is a fascinating and exciting and interesting and challenging exercise. Equally, I could sit with you for a day in your office on the whiteboard down to the level of, you know, how is this social media campaign running to promote this thing that you're launching on Tuesday? And I don't know where and how I got it, um, but I did benefit a lot from my university training in Wellington where I was trained to become an architect and there maybe is something about that because they do try to train you in architecture school to be very Mm. conceptual, creative, open, almost artistic. And at the same time, they treat train you to uh, think logically, structurally, uh, you know, architecturally, programmatically. And that hybrid, I think, you know, anyone that isn't quite sure what they want to be like, going to design or architecture school is really uh, a fascinating option, even if you don't think you're any good at, you know, drawing or have any ideas. Interesting. Or something like that would be great. Mm -hmm. They should create programs like that that aren't necessarily so boxed in, like, oh, if you do this, you've got to be an architect. Because I think most people that do architecture school, I'm not sure how many actually end up becoming an architect. But in the end, you're an architect of everything you're involved in and you're an architect of your own life. You're an architect of your own career. You're an architect Mm -hmm. of your own uh, company if you're building one. So to think like an architect, which is a hybrid of an artist and an engineer, Yes. for me at least the metaphor is a beautiful way to live life because sometimes I want to be a poet and a writer and a thinker and an artist, but I also want to build things and make things happen. And that connection uh, is is part of my you know part of my DNA, and it's a, a fantastic skill set to have. And I'm sure there's a blend of you know training and learnings from things you've done, but also a natural uh, ability to do that. And I'm sure it's been a huge advantage. And it was so clear for me when you were talking about architecture, because I think generally we think about architecture, we think about uh, architects sitting there with uh, beautiful uh, building designs, you know, very mm. high level entire building. But then you've also got to figure out uh, where am I, where literally where am I going to put the PowerPoint so this room is functional when it <laughs> gets, gets built, right? So yeah, being in the beginning for sure, yeah. Get to that. My room favorite deep, architects level. actually. Uh, my favorite architects actually never went to architecture school, which I also thought was fascinating. But um, mm. yeah, it's 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 super super interesting, and whatever it is that's enabled me to be able to switch these modes, uh, I'm forever grateful for it. Uh, I don't think it's anything I necessarily did. But once I understood that I could do these switch between these two modes, which essentially is like being able to operate at one foot or 50,000 feet, yes. um, I've done everything in my own power to improve my ability to operate at both of those levels, but also improve my ability to switch. And I think switching mm-hmm. is super powerful as a muscle. And I, I think the, the, the most interesting and creative and wonderful people that I've worked with are able to do that. They're able to switch between you know, the top of the mountain and the foot of the mountain. And then you really can have fascinating interplay between Mm. the reality of what it actually takes to do things, but not get so connected to it that you aren't a dreamer. And that's for me, I always want to be able to be a dreamer at the same time, have some semblance of how that dream might come true. 
Because mm. one of the uh, inhibitors, I would imagine, being able to go from uh, 50,000 feet to one feet is that suddenly you can get very buried in tasks at the one foot level. So being able yeah. to appreciate what is required at the one foot level, but not necessarily become the doer of all those tasks because then you just you know, fall out of the leverage zone and um, wouldn't actually end up achieving much because you just get buried in the, in the one foot right. tasks all the time. Uh, and that's back to your kind of thinking space time where you're like, okay, there's these tasks, there are these uh, operational things that need to be done. Okay, who is best placed to do them? Uh, where are the resources? Do I have the right resources or people, whatever it might be, and making sure that those, those people are all in the, right, in the right places. And as you're growing a business or growing any organization, those decisions are the ones that help you step change, I think. Yeah gold uh derek uh let's uh bring this to a close we've really appreciated your insights it's been uh such a great conversation i've really enjoyed it but you also refer to yourself as an astronaut in waiting <laughs> give us that give us the update one one why are you uh so excited about being an astronaut and how's the plan coming together to make that happen well, whenever anyone asks me about the plan, I, I defer because I don't know and it keeps changing and moving. So I've kind of checked out of it. Um, I know it gets one foot in front of the other each day. The reason I've always loved uh, space, I you know remember very clearly as a nine-year-old that my first kind of project at school that I remember doing, you know, you did a little project and assignment and you wrote up and drew pictures and stuff was uh, about space and astronauts and the moon and going going to space. Uh, you know, I've always loved um, the Kennedys, Bobby Kennedy and JFK and, and part of that adventure that, that JFK accelerated. And yes. I'm also, you know, very interested in thinkers like Carl Sagan, the astronomer, who really force you to think about the biggest picture of things, the, the whole worldwide existence, universe-wide existence, and uh, that sense of awe and perspective, I find super fascinating and powerful and moving and so if i can somehow participate in, in in even scratching that surface by seeing the world even if it's just for a moment from from that height and be a part of the vanguard of civilians who help usher in that 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 era uh that that is something that i'm i'm you know i'm, I'm signed up for and i'm interested in participating in so it's a combination of all those things, this kind of memory of being, you know, a nine-year-old and somehow falling into this, this influence, which again, actually was when I was 14, I did a project on the Kennedys in history. And I then, this, this sense of perspective that has been really invaluable to me in the most difficult times when things are really difficult, my, my go-to strategy is perspective and or so moving backwards and backwards and backwards from the situation I'm in to the point that the, the situation I'm in looks like a pin. And I see all the other situations that are around that really put into perspective my own individual ego, feelings, frustration, hurt, harm, whatever it might be, or fear. Um, to me, my number one strategy for dealing with that stuff is zooming right out. So I think all of those ideas are connected to why, why this, this adventure is important to me. It is uh, such great insight, Derek. Thank you for, for sharing that. Derek, look, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Some of the insights you've, you've shared, the thinking I can feel my own neurons bouncing around the walls of my brain, uh, given some of the things you've talked about. And we'd look, just like to acknowledge you as an entrepreneur, as a fellow Kiwi and a New Zealander, someone that has, uh, you know, in their own way, conquered, conquered the mountain, but has always taken the time, energy, and ever to look at how can I help other people, whether it's been through your foundation or whether it's been through your uh, venture capital investment, you know, you've, you've done so much more for the world and lots of people, I think, uh, stand around talking about uh, changing the lives of others, uh, but you absolutely have. And I don't know what that number is, but when you look at your influence across the globe and how many different people you've touched through your uh, guidance and investments, uh, I think it's just a phenomenal effort. Uh, thank you so much for, for being you and for what you're contributing. I think we could do with a, uh, a world full of Derek's. It'd be a, uh, a reasonably good place. And we won't ask your wife to comment on whether more than one Derek's a good thing or not. 
<laughs> thank you so much for your you know kind words i don't think i ever sit back and think about it like that but um i've really appreciated this conversation and the ability to reflect on some of these questions and thoughts and it's always powerful to go back on them in your own mind and, and, and express them so i deeply appreciate the chance you know me i'm like pretty much everyone like you and everyone listening to this podcast that's a constant work in progress and the only thing that I think I'm way better at now that, than I am in 20 years ago is better at deeply understanding, you know, what, what, am I, what am I trying to be in this world and who am I? And I think that is an adventure that we're all on. But if I have any kind of lasting or parting comment, it's, that's actually become the most valuable guide to me, which is the inner looking like, and seeking and searching inside is this true to me? Is this thing I'm about to do right? Is this authentic with the person I'm trying to show up in the world as? And definitely for a lot of my adult life, that question has been very difficult and I've made decisions that have not truly reflected that answer in full integrity. But, you know, more and more, I feel like I'm making more decisions that are right than are wrong. So conversations like this are super helpful to help me stay on track as well so thank you so much for having me uh, absolute pleasure Derek and great closing comments and don't forget to uh, give us away from space <laughs> see you later <laughs> <laughs>